Okay, I'm going to um, move the chairs for a minute because for the next several minutes we want to have Marina and Neil engage in a conversation and then uh, after we sort of exhaust that a little bit then we'll open it up to the artists and finish and have that conversation. So we can do that whenever it feels good for you guys. Okay? Okay. So... I'll well, scoot over here. I'll scoot over here. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm fascinating by is like we're at the point where we're living in kind of these two economies. There is the economy of money, and we all need it. We all live in the physical world. We need to eat, we have pay shelter, rent. pay rent, whatever, send kids to school, um, all kinds of other things. And then there's this other economy of this gift economy. You know, there's many names for that. Where, which is operating in some ways on a very different currency system. And um, it's fascinating for me to think about, you know, one of the things that I think about is how these new forms of production, they really, for a century, we've been taught that we're all rational economic actors, uh, act out of self-interest, and money kind of flows into that. And the, there's all these other currencies that are flowing. And actually, if you look at our lives in general, you know, we do c tons of production with, for no money. We care for our children. We care for older people. We do things for our friends. Those are all forms of production that we don't kind of notice. We don't even think about it as something creating value, and yet it is. But it's kind of like this form of production is capitalizing on new currencies, what you said about you have access to all these resources that, because it's not just money can get you resources, your social capital can get you resources. So what, what, what are your thoughts on, like what, what's the currencies that are flowing in these economies? Um, well, I mean, one of the things that, that, um, that uh, people talk about reputation and trust um, and, and I think in, in, in we're sort of experiencing a, 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 an economic crisis, so we're asking these questions about the economy and starting to discover that there are, are these other ways of exchanging value and, and people are consciously trying to break the monopoly of sort of the, uh, the money system as a, a medium of exchange. Um, and so a sort of diverse ecosystem of ways of exchanging value and creating values is um, starting to present itself. Um, I think one that doesn't, one currency that doesn't get often get talked about um, is, uh, I don't even know if it's really a currency, but I think purpose is really important um, in, uh, in a, a sort of uncertain environment and um, on a kind of unpredictable landscape that when, I just see so many times, like, you know, like a Kickstarter project is an example of this. You, you write up a clear statement of what it is you want to produce and you know, and if it's well articulated and um, and and kind of unique, um, you know, people rally around it. You know, it's um, and so having like a clear purpose is a sort of currency. And and if it's a purpose for something that that's positive, that serves the common good, and that's very visible and that's transparent to a lot of people, you know, this resources come your way. You know, it's like you planting a, a you know a flag in the ground and saying. Let's rally around this. And what do, what do you think of this? And then people, people come and and put, you know, sort of like a, you know, everyone brings a brick, and then and then we, you get a house. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but are you thinking? So if you take it long term, uh -huh. are we? And I don't know what the time horizon may be. Is it ten years, twenty years, fifty years? Do you see money going out of the system as a currency, or how do you see that evolving? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I tend at this point um, to think that rather it'll just, there'll be um, coexisting forms of exchange um, um, and that the, the, the sort, of, um, sort of central bank sort of monetary system, right, um, will lose its, lose its importance um, hmm. uh, to, uh, and, and, and to a certain extent. I think there, there's a tremendous amount of dialogue uh, and criticism um, and media that's being made right now that criticizes that. So people, are, their awareness of how that system works and how it doesn't really serve us or it, it only serves a small uh, you know, portion of us, a small group of people, 
um, uh, that that uh, you know we I see you know and, and we write about on shareable all these different new um, new currencies that are getting created. Yeah, so I think a, I think it's more that it'll be kind of an ecology of different uh, exchange systems or currencies. Yeah, I I kind of think that it it may be that we've been so out of balance in that what is being produced in the money economy and what's being produced in other ways that maybe we're going through a process of sort of rebalancing the world that, you know, there's a lot more. I mean, clearly one of the things that we're seeing as these kind of social production models are growing is that value is being taken out of the other system. So whether it's in music labels or studios or publishing or you, across domains, uh, I just saw this kind of a little bit scary statistics. If you look at rates, uh, uh, return on assets of the 20,000 U.S. public companies over the last, since 1965, uh -huh. it's been going like this, down. And so actually the projection is that by 2022, they're going to go to zero, which is a pretty interesting. And I'm trying to unpack that, like, where did that money go? It's possible that it's all gone into our financial system and that's where the money, but it's really creating no value. So there is a kind of um, rebalancing that we need, we need to redeploy these people. We need to redeploy those assets. And it's possible that more of the value will be created through things like Wikipedia that's basically a not-for-profit. And, right. and, and, but it requires also people some, that's another big part of it is, so are people, do you see kind of a generation of people deciding that there is a different kind of value system and meaning that they're after rather than money? Because, you know, that's a big sort of unknown to me yet. Yeah. I mean, I think there always has been, you know, communities that saw value outside of money. I mean, the artistic community comes immediately to mind. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, the, there is um, there is kind of a shift um, a shift in I hate this term, like, but this is the term that's used, like consumer behavior, um, and and uh, I don't like the word consumer. That's a horrible word. It should be banned. But but uh, <laughs> um, uh, and so people are are thinking more carefully about their own resources and and what it is they actually need to have a good life. Um, and, uh, and, and also realizing, you know, if, uh, if you go through, if you go through a financial crisis, um, you, you, re you know, my, my guess is, and I've had this experience also, is that you definitely reevaluate. You're like, well, how did I get in this spot and what's really important to me? And you may even feel constraints. I mean, like, I can't go on vacation. I can't buy the car and, and this kind of thing. And you, and you start to think about, well, what's really important? Then you start to think about things like relationships, and and um, and and maybe you could spend more time outdoors um, and connect with nature or create art, um, or that there's that thing that you wanted to do, and and now you have all that time, and and so you can do it, um, mm -hmm. and invest in that. So I think that I think that that is happening. Um, you know, whether that's that's durable or not, you know, I don't know. I, I kind of get the sense that we're at least coming sort of uh, near the end of this kind of consumer economy. Um, it's sort of a phony economy, really. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, where the, the wealth is created through finan financial manipulation and, and the production and selling of crap we don't even fucking need. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting. The, some of the things we've been doing at the Institute, so, you know, there's all this research now shows that actually having, you know, beyond a certain point where you need a certain amount of income to be comfortable, beyond that point, the more accumulate, you, it's not correlated with happiness or satisfaction or all other things. And the pleasure in terms of buying or having goods doesn't come from owning them, but from social interactions that they bring. So some of the things we've been thinking about is, you know, what is it that you have that's an idle resource for you or that, and that's part of shareable mm -hmm. that you can socialize because you can take that idle resource 
And basically, if you share it, all of a sudden you create this tremendous value and goodwill, and it also brings you pleasure. So some of the things we've been doing is uh, we have space, not as beautiful as this space, but some <laughs> space. And so we've been offering this space to co-working, and um, we just advertise it on social media. And the first time we did it, we just had no idea who's going to show up. Uh, but turns out that really interesting people showed up, artists and people who are working, um, entrepreneurs and individuals. I came. You came, <laughs> yes. Somebody, and somehow connections started happening, and people were having great conversations, and it kind of provided this little buzz to our own employees and staff and all of that, and all of a sudden you just realize, okay, this space is not utilized probably 50% of the time. If you can turn it into social space, you get tremendous value. So I think if all of us turn to ourselves and say, well, what is it that I have that's underutilized, that's idle, that I can socialize? Because the value, the, the real pleasure of all these things comes from social interactions around them. But I, I don't think, I think we've been sold kind of a bowl of goods or yeah. thinking about what it is and what brings us pleasure and what brings us value and how we get happy and all of that. And the reality is not like that at all. Our colleague, Jane McGonigal, just wrote a book called Reality is Broken, where, in which she talks about all of that, that. And luckily now, through science of happiness and psychology and behavioral economics, we're just realizing that all of that thinking is a kind of a, a game that we've been sold, and it doesn't really work very well. Right. I mean, you know, the, the, for me, like consumer, what consumer culture does is like, you know, all value is outside of the individual and outside of community. It's like if your hair is, you know, blonde, it should be brunette. And if, it, you know, you, you should, if you, you shouldn't, you know, the cool people are somewhere else. The cool things that are happening are somewhere else. Um, the cool things to have you don't have. Um, and, and I think this new way of thinking is more about, like, realizing what it is you already have and, and, uh, and, and offering that out. Um, but also um, thinking about it collectively, like what else, what, is my, what do my friends have? Um, you know, what could I give to them, but what do they have? You know, so it's, uh, you really, uh, my experience is like in doing that salon, you know, was that people had a really hard time actually getting, receiving help, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in a kind of gift economy, you both have to be okay with giving away, but also okay with receiving. And that's the only way that you can get things to flow. And so when we, you know, uh, when, you know, the marketplace starts to break down or money becomes scarce and you, you're not, you know, uh, uh, you know, employment isn't so secure, money is scarce, then we can, you know, we, we turn to each other then, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's more and more what we see at Shareable is people realizing what they have, um, <coughs> the common wealth that they have together and cultivating that. Maybe you can, um, there's some very cool projects that I know you write about on Shareable, like Neighbor Goods, just name a few of those before we open it up. So Neighbor yeah. Goods. Yeah, so there's, there's Neighbor Goods. And Do you guys know about Neighbor Goods? So go ahead. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, it's a peer-to-peer -peer rental marketplace. So if you have a, there's a slide up there about it. You can put your zip code. And yeah, you can load, if you have stuff like a, Lawn a lawnmower or that you tools. only use maybe once a month. You can create. I'm doing this blog on Shareable called "The Year of Living Shareably." So I'm 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 starting to try out all this stuff, um, and and uh, you know and rethinking my life that way. So I've done things like um, I started doing social lending, peer to peer lending on Lending Club, um, and which has I, better returns than the market actually. Yeah, it's like nine percent instead of my bank account Wells Fargo is like getting under like one percent, and they also skim $2 billion from their customers in California and, and overdraft fees, and we're fine. $200 billion. I don't understand how that works, but... Um, <laughs> uh, Neither do they. <laughs> <laughs> Good lawyers. Um, yeah, so there's... Neighbor uh, goods, uh, car Airbnb. I, I, did, I did my first Airbnb, which is um, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, accommodations. It's like couch surfing. So you can travel and go and stay at someone's house, or you can let your house out to travelers. And a lot of people are augmenting their income by letting a piece of their house out or their apartment out, and they can stay with a friend or something. Um, Car sharing. Yeah, so there's relay rides. Um, so 
Zipcar and City Car Share have been around for a while, but now the, the, the car sharing thing has taken uh, a next step, sort of peer-to-peer -peer car sharing is emerging where you can rent um, and uh, lease, you know, rent out and rent your neighbor's cars. Um, you know, and, and there's so the, the companies like Relay Rides and there's others who like get around, um, they don't own any fleet. They just, um, they just have a platform which you can find on your iPhone or whatever. You can find cars, you know, in your neighborhood that you can, re that you can rent. Um, and there's actually a new law in California that just got passed in January that made this happen. So we are in this period, like, the laws are getting, people are rewriting the laws that, so that we can serve each other, so that we can rent things out. But you can, you, you know, from textbooks to um, uh, high-end, um, you know, camera lenses, uh, uh, ball gowns and, and purses and, and luxury shoes. purses, shoes, um, uh, just about just about anything now is is you're able to put into kind of social to socialize it. Yeah. yeah, and and the only way those things work and what helps is the more people participate, the more people. It's a network effect. The more people, so the more you can put into that, the better all those platforms are. Yeah, and they, and you know, speaking of Jane's book, like there's a, a company called ThreadUp where. Um, you know, parents exchange um, kids' clothes and toys, and, and they've gamified the exchanging of um, um, toys and clothes. Um, so the better community member you are and the, the higher rating that your boxes of clothes get and um, the more transactions you do, the, you know, you can level up, you can find yourself on the leaderboard of the homepage because you're a good, you know, good community member. It's really, it's really fun. It's in bringing people together and really rewarding, I think, you know, positive, constructive behavior. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is I think we really do have to share um, as a, like, survival strategy. I mean, we have to simultaneously, you know, bring down our, the carbon, you know, for, to 350 parts per million, right, and raise, you know, like 2 billion people out of poverty at the same time. And there's only one way to do that. We have to learn how to share our resources. And, and we have to do both at the same time because, you know, this, uh, they go together. I mean, environmental and social, uh, environmental, you know, uh, conservation and, and uh, social justice, these, these are one and the same, actually. So we uh, open up the conversation in, uh, to a slightly larger circle here, and let me ask uh, if any of the artists in the circle have questions or comments. Um, we've got a mic here, um, and we've got one here, so. I have a question. At first, I want to say I appreciate what you both are saying, because I feel like there's a very pessimistic worldview right now, and what you're sharing is an optimistic view of the future. Um, and I appreciate that, and I, I, I hope that that takes us all somewhere, and that's something that my work's been particularly looking at for the last five years. But I guess I have a question, because <clears throat> even, excuse me, I have a cold. Even in the last conversation we had, we talked about being in the Bay Area and having a history of, for example, the diggers who believed everything should be free and everything should be shared, or the history of the Black Panther Party's breakfast program, which fed children. And so there's not that there's not a history of this. There is. And, um, and we can all sort of look to today and see where those movements re still resonate in the moment. And at the same time, between that, that big sort of um, movement, there was also the 80s and extreme greed mm -hmm. and leading us up to this moment. And so as much as I, I feel the optimism and I... Uh -huh and I believe in it and I hope for it, um, I still wonder, you know, that didn't entirely prevail, that sentiment, and so will this? Mm -hmm. um, I actually, it's, it's great that I, I feel like I'm kind of schizophrenic a lot of times because, you know, when you think about the future and you look at the data on climate change and it's a pretty scary scenario, and you get totally scared and pessimistic. And then I start thinking about this stuff and all the possibilities of this and seeing what people are doing, and it's not like out there. People are actually doing it, um, and I get totally optimistic. I think that is the solution to a lot of... Now, what it, to me is different between what's happening now and like the 80s is that it is so easy. The costs of doing this have gone down so much that it can take only a few people connected through these. The, the technology has really 
dr has driven the costs of doing it down. So all of that, that only few people could do and it required a lot of effort, it's kind of seamless. It's almost, and not a lot of people, relatively not as many people are doing it, but it's kind of transforming. And I do think that, you know, even kids who are now growing up with where they can pose a question online and get, they're, they're kind of, they grow up with this idea that knowledge is shareable, ideas are shareable, I don't need to have an answer, somebody else has to have, I can dip into somebody else, and there is this resource, Wikipedia that's created out there, and all of that, that's what makes me optimistic. And, and it's a kind of, we call it at the Institute, urgent optimism. It's, it's something that, you can be optimistic, but unless you work to make it happen, and it's easy, I think the technology is what making it possible. And to me, that's the difference between like today and the 80s. Yeah, the um, and and what what I keep hearing from the entrepreneurs in this space too, are building these platforms that help people share is, um, you know, that that what is really driving their business is that their uh, users. Um, are, have a better experience than buying. That it, it, it's something, uh, they're having experiences that actually you can't buy to, uh, to some extent. One, one, and one example is couch, is couch surfing. And, and um, you know, it's, you offer, if you're a couch surfer, you can offer up your couch to a traveler or tra go traveling yourself. Um, and they built a system which, um, you know, gives people a, and a culture which, you know, w what you're supposed to do if you host someone is show them around and to, you know, their, their, their local area and, like, sh see the real thing, you know? Um, and, you know, you can't buy that. It's not for sale. Right? And it's, a and better, it's so easy to do. And it's easy to do. And, they, and there's tr trust mechanisms. They have very few problems. Um, with uh, with bad experiences, um, and and uh, so that's like that gives me really hope. So this whole thing is kind of kind of scalable, right? Uh, um, and and driven by just the fact that people have better experiences. Couch surfing just being kind of one example. Um, it's just this that that social production or that s kind of socialized economy where you know it's it's peer based. I mean, this is more fun. You meet people, and 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 then there's all these follow-on kind of things that happen when you start connecting with people, you know, um, around a car that you share or a couch that you share or whatever it is. Um, it, it it leads to other conversations and opportunities. I mean, that's um, what we see is like sharing leads to more sharing. It's like they start with one little thing. You know, this is how all movements start and organizing kind of. Um, initiative started. You start with one little thing, and then and then are, and then people look around. Wow, that was kind of a victory. Like, well, what more could we do? You know, what other thing you, you could do? Could there's a example of the um, a group, a neighborhood group in Portland um, that they started a potluck, and and they did that for a monthly potluck, and then that went so well. Then um, they started all kinds of stuff like you know babysitting co-op and a pizza oven and a um, you know, bulk, bulk food purchases, and they created their own sort of like collective in the sub suburb based on that. Who else has a question? So one thing I just want to address is that, um, you know, and building on your question too, was that, you know, this idea of sharing, and a lot of artists do share a lot of resources and spaces and everything you're talking about in terms of couch surfing and stuff is, you know, musicians have done this for, you know, generations and stuff too. So there is all of these built-in networks and systems that artists utilize these systems to begin with. So I don't, when I'm hearing these things, I'm not thinking of it as something new. Um, I think it, and that's, I think exactly what you're kind of building on too. As the, and, but some of the issues with artists is that, you know, we work 30, 40 hours you know, a week, and then our share time, and then we need, we have our share time as participating in a community, and then on top of that, we gotta, we need our individual time to produce work. Right. You know, that then gets shared. So this idea of volunteering additional time on top of that, when we're involved in communities and working jobs for property or for debt, towards education that made us creative knowledge-based <laughs> knowledge thinkers. Um, so I was hoping that you guys might address some of those ideas or concerns. Yeah, yeah that's a hard one because it's, I mean there is, I mean the, first of all, I mean just 
making rent, I mean, we have a speculative real estate market and, and uh, a certain sort of property system, which, which is, you know, it's really hard to get around, right? Um, the, there, there are ways to do it that we, that we write about on shareable, like housing co-ops and community land trusts. And, and so, uh, you know, while I hear you about the stress that volunteering, uh, you know, can bring, that um, I think there's some mechanisms of, of, of artists organized um, that they could kind of create their own sort of microeconomy and get, get out of that sort of um, speculative, and not be victims of that speculative sort of cycle. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that happens is, uh, in, in real estate markets and cities is like, you know, artists will go in and, and into an inexpensive area and, and it, it'll become the cool area. And then, and then this whole cycle of real estate speculation starts. Um, but if, if, there was, uh, if there was sort of a collaboration between artists and community foundations and maybe some other players that could come in and create community land trusts and housing co-ops, um, there could be a way to kind of like keep the lid on the, on the, on the uh, expenses for artists. But, but I totally sympathize with what you're saying because there is a, the other side of it. We call this kind of era we're living in is amplification, you know, that you know, before you had these organizations that provided all of this and now the burden is on you. And for artists it's been a long time, it's been like that for a while, but it's becoming for all of us. So it is, there is an other side which is burden of time and time to not, to disconnect and not participate. And I think it's more and more people in a way are becoming like artists. And part of it is that we're kind of living on the cusp of these two systems. So you mentioned the, the debt burden from educational institutions that haven't been restructured for a, over a hundred years. And you know, there are alternatives to getting that education in the way that we've been getting it for a long time, but we're not there yet, you know? And only a few brave souls can brave outside of that system and say, you know what, I can get those skills and I can get that knowledge in other ways, but work we're very early on. So unfortunately, you are living kind of in the middle of these two worlds. Yeah, because you want to tell your students to not go to school at this expensive institution immediately. Exactly. You right. know, you don't, you, you want to say that, but at the same time, if you say that, then you don't have work. I'm totally, <laughs> yes. But there are other ways of, um, yeah, there are all kinds of, so, it, it requires kind of rethinking, well, what is that model? So what if you were not teaching at a university or college, but what if you had a class of people you were mentoring and you were kind of having a class that you were guiding and they were paying you directly? I, I, it requires a brave soul to say, you know what, I'm gonna create my own system. The possibilities are there, but it's, it's, it's hard, it's not easy. Somebody is gonna be doing it and more and more people are gonna be doing it. Whether you wanna be one of the pioneers. I'm totally in the middle of that because I have a son who's in college and we're in constant conversation about why do I need to go to class on their schedule, on do things that they want me to do rather than, and I'm like, huh, yeah, I totally get that. And are you brave them. enough to? to get into your own system, uh, to create all those resources, because that's a burden of it. And the, again, that goes back to time and the artist's time. Yeah. Which I think all artists in your face. So. Right. I, I, mean, I think my comment and question is really similar, but I was gonna pose it that the actual production is already volunteerism, because I don't think probably anybody in the circuit circle has cut a profit. <laughs> I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, like is anybody living off it? I mean, yeah. I don't, I mean, I've been doing it for 20 some odd years and I've never not cut a loss on my taxes. So I already think that my mm -hmm. production is a form of sharing and volunteerism yep. culturally and socially and psychologically and all that. So I'm just putting that out there as that's our shared time. And then um, I really was struck by Marina's comment about just um, sort of in terms of technology, so how, which I'm, this really excites me and extremely worries me, and I've, I've watched, I've been a part of a lot of this. So in terms of um, 
publishing, so for writers, musicians, um, cultural producers of all kinds, artists, visual artists, uh, dancers, um, how our work is now so spreadable and shared in this really exciting way. Mm -hmm. um, but but what, what little sort of capital you could count on, so-called so profit for selling a book or a CD or not having to tour for nine months out of the year or um, actually thinking that people would go see your show because they couldn't only access it online and then maybe that would lead to further opportunities. Like those things are being really, yep. there's this, at, at the time that there's this really altruistic thing that I really celebrate in that, there's also um, that I don't think there's, I can't quote a study, this is all just kind of off the top of my head, that there is real fiscal um, loss in that mm -hmm. for individuals and Absolutely. organizations. And so I'm just putting that out there as right. um, part of our conversation. And, and that's why I, I agree with you. But if you look at like the profit for artists, right, and what's been happening, it's only a few artists, and I don't know, it depends on what kind of art, obviously. But if you look at musicians, right, it's only a few, it's a power law. So a few people get huge profits, the majority of the people get virtually yeah. nothing. So there may be some kind of a equilibration going well, on. I, I mean, I ran a small in, independent record label for nine years, right at the, and I, and I closed it in 2005, 2006, yeah. like right at that cusp. But there were several bands on that label that could sort of live off what they did mm -hmm. and tour four months out of the year. They now have to tour eight or nine months out of the year because people don't buy the product, but they mm -hmm. do go to the shows. So it's, there, there was this sort of shift, definitely. Right. So that, mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, that middle, the sort of DIY kind of mid-ground got cut out in music. But in art, it seems to, at least locally, th there's also a blossoming alternative gallery scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That has to do with the real estate crash, though, I huh. guess. So. Because everybody knows the <laughs> burning there. Now that I but see. right. And, and that's why I think this is a time to rethink the traditional business models. And, you know, each musician is trying out different things and, you know, creating local scene and creating all kinds of things. Um, but, yeah, I agree, the traditional models just don't work. So I think I wanted to comment um, for a moment to come back to the history in the Bay Area and that so many of the ideas that we're talking about today too have, there have been sort of outbursts of them periodically in the Bay Area. And what I see is that we're in this moment where we have this incredible new connectedness and technology through social, um, social media that we can actually, in a sense, apply the economies of scale to these previous ideas. Like when you talked about the, um, like I remember my mom totally did the whole like bulk buying thing. I mean, that's like people have been doing that for a really long time. But now we have a chance to not only do that with a much wider group of people, we can find people that have the same interests that we do. But I think we also have the opportunity to create models that are then replicable. We can share them. And I love that. I love the fact that we don't have to sit in our own little communities and, and try and recreate the wheel every time around, but that we can come up with these smart new models and just share them across continents and societies and the entire world. And I also think that what, what both of you said about you know, the, the difficulties of being an artist and, and making money and sort of how does that tie into this, is that this is, I always see this like what we're dealing with right now and the, like the work that you're doing with the shareable as like the first step. This is like, this is, this is by no means the end of the journey and the experiment, mm -hmm. but that the need, that there is a need to fundamentally reevaluate our economy and our economic model because we all know that the constantly producing more and more and more is not sustainable. We cannot continue doing that. And I think we're in this incredibly powerful time and moment here where we can actually propose new ways of doing it. And I think that also, the, I've always been in love with the idea of micro payments. I know it hasn't really taken off yet, but I think with the technology also comes uh, the personal commitment to use your money wisely. Like if you like something that someone did, my God, go buy that album, pay the money because we're still needing to use that to put food on our table and roofs over our head. And you can judiciously use the resources that you have to affect great, powerful change. I had an argument with a friend of mine uh, um, a little while ago who, who buys all of his books on Amazon and I'm a big science fiction reader. And I'm like, I go to Borderlands. I, don't, I might have to wait for the book to get ordered. 
And, you know, I'm mm-hmm. actually trying to try and fight for, like, my parking or to take my time to travel over there. But, like, I put my money there because I want them to still be there with their hairless cats and everything. They're, they're just, they're wonderful. And you have to sort of vote for the future you want with your money and how you educate the people around you and how you promote these ideas. I think we're, but again, with the social media, we're in an incredibly powerful time to spread these mm-hmm. ideas and these new systems. Uh, just kind of building on your optimism. Actually, I, when I'm, I was reading um, some Marshall McLuhan, um, <laughs> just like, I, know, I had the book sitting on my shelf for ages, and just, you know, I think after the food conversation, I just went, oh, this is some futurism. But he had, um, <laughs> in the introduction to his um, second edition of his book, um, Understanding Media, he had a really great quote that's sort of a call to arms to artists. Um, said the power of the arts to fully anticipate um, future social and te- technological developments by a generation and more has long been recognized. In this century, meaning 20th century, Ezra Pound called the artist the antenna of the race. Art as radar acts as an early alarm system, as it were, enabling us to discover social and psychic targets and lots of time to prepare to cope with them. The, art, the concept of arts is prophetic contrast with the, idea, the popular idea of, of them as a mere self-expression. Um, art as radar environment takes a function of indispensable perceptual training rather than the role of the privileged diet for the elite. Um, so I think this, you know, not just in economic sense, but, um, you know, it cuts across all lines. And actually in, in your essay that we read, actually there was a quote I'd kind of like to read from that one to... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, Mr. Quote tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You're well prepared. Um, yes, did my homework this time. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't talk last time, so I, I feel like i got to you know, step it up a notch. Um, but it kind no of pressure. ties into what you are saying about, cha- you know, we're obviously in a, a period of tremendous change, which is alternately exciting and terrifying. Um, but um, what you said about uh, we see new, new structures emerge little by little from the uh, contribution. <laughs> God, I'm so nervous. <clears throat> of many in this, they resemble biological structures in which complexity emerges without a grand central design. The emergence of new organizational s- forms coincides with discoveries in neuroscience, biology, quantum physics, and uh, increased ability to model and understand interactions in complex systems. And, um, you know, it's been like with uh, Newton and da Vinci, you know just came up with very similar ideas in very different mm-hmm. media. And uh, Picasso and Einstein, you know, I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, you know, slacking on my game and <laughs> my role as an artist in, uh, um, I'm not sure I'm pulling my weight in there, but I think, you know, I do believe, alter- you know, um, in the power of, of artists and the interconnectedness of, um, um, you know, maybe it's because I grew up in the Bay Area, all granolified, but, you know, <laughs> the way things uh, can emerge out of this. And I think it's a really exciting time to, you know, since we're sort of in the, the center of this technology explosion that's, you know, giving us an incredibly, incredible change in the Middle East and all over the mm-hmm. world, it's just exciting to, to be here and exciting to um, see the possibilities of yeah. what can emerge from this. And I totally agree with you that I think artists oftentimes see things before, like we, in, when we think about the future, oftentimes we look to art because artists kind of have the insight that different from maybe scientific method, but I think there's many different ways of knowing and I think artists can kind of see the future in, in a different way. Yeah, we're, I mean, it, we're, I was just thinking about, we've been talking about the future and the past and talking about, you know, attempts in the Bay Area to establish some, like, alternative economy or alternative economic models. And, and you know, I, I think back to, uh, think back to the, the, a little bit that I know about the history of bike sharing, right? And there's really been three generations of bike sharing. And the first one, like, in the, I think it was in the late 60s or something, it was the white bikes, and they all got stolen or repainted or thrown in the canals. And this was in, in I think, Amsterdam, right? And, and, uh, 
and uh, you know, and it took you know 40 years to, and only in 1997 with the VLIB system in Paris, and they kind of had all the right technology and ideas about how to do it, and uh, and a and, and a business model which isn't perfect and there, it's problematic, but it was good enough that that uh, you know bike sharing is now spreading all over the world, and actually is the f um, according to some the fastest form. The fastest growing form of public transportation is bike sharing. And uh, mm. just about every major city that doesn't already have a bike sharing program, in the United States at least, um, is, is planning them. And bike sharing is going to come to the Bay Area on a region-wide basis from San Francisco to San Jose later, later this year. Um, or at least it will start, start producing them. So this is a pretty cool so thing. Hopefully in, st in time before Caltrain stops running. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 so I guess the the message there is that like just because it hasn't worked before doesn't it doesn't mean it, it can't work now or work in the future. So it's like keep trying. <clears throat> uh, hey, uh, anybody ever been to Burning Man? Anybody? Four of us burners. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, just wondering. Um, there. It seems to me that there already are mm -hmm. multiple economies in play. There are multiple value systems in play. Um, you know, less than 5% of the global population um, owns more than 95% of global wealth. Um, so there already are multiple economies. And it, it seems that that 5% is deeply invested in keeping that proportion the way that it is. And part of that vested interest manifests itself in um, psychosocial dogma as integrated and disseminated through the educational system. That there is... <laughs> <I'm a> preacher, <laughs> right? So that there's... Um, so that there's a way that my nine-year-old son has um, an emerging view on wealth, not value, but on wealth, that holds to your, um, through your college-age son and probably percolates through all of us, that um, we don't have a shared understanding of what enough is, what the threshold is, when you've made it. So if you're able to afford a car A, is that enough? Or is it not enough until you're able to afford car B? Or is that not enough until you can house both A and B in house C? Um, so I guess I just want to throw out a couple of things. One is that um, the ownership of distribution channels and um, and models for distribution really seems to be at the heart of the issue. How it is that artists can move from being disseminators of cool to disseminators of right. sociological paradigms. Because we're really good at cool, and have been, and are not rewarded for that, right? Not in terms of dollars and cents. Um, so, how, you know, so one, how do you take over the distribution channels? How do you shift um, art from being an extracurricular exercise that serves as a harbinger of cool to a curricular exercise that is a little bit more um, socially, dri um, more driven in terms of social mission and collective social mission? Um, so that, that's the first thing is the distribution channels. And then, and then the second question I guess I have for all of us is um, what is enough? Like when are you wealthy? Or when are you rich? Um, is it just about your survival, sustainable survival practices? If you can make it on your art, is that enough? Or is it not enough until you're able to leave your job for a year and search or is it not enough until right so so when is enough and i think it's an individual thing but clearly there's also a community agreement that we need to reach um and then the third question in terms of distribution channels is um 
and this really is for the two of you, there's a disconnect between the goods that are made and the way that those goods trickle down to the population, right? So the car that David Slaza makes would be awesome for me to drive, right? If only David Slaza, who lives in California, could um, find a cost-efficient and environmentally um, safe way of getting his car in California to me in New York on a mass scale. And if we don't own the distribution channels in terms of communication, and we don't control the distribution channels in terms of um, sharing these mass goods, then how is it that these artistic principles take over the microeconomies that you guys are describing? Un de toi. David has an answer. <laughs> we have an answer? Uh, no, I, lo I love that. I, so, um, I love your challenge to the artist uh, to be the disseminator of these new sociological models because I have a degree in sociology and I'm an artist. Um, but it's often impossible, I find, because as an artist, um, you're in many ways much more, or for me in my art, I'm much more trapped in this kind of money economy of trying to make a living through my art. Whereas as a sociologist, if you do decently well, you have sort of a basic income as a graduate student and a professor, et cetera. So you're, mu you're much more like beholden to this economic reality of trying to find a way that the market will keep you alive. And I think that's a really, um, except for very few artists, it's a really disempowering thing. Uh, but I think, I think that your question about w you know, when is enough, um, that was one I, I had written down too that I wanted to ask. Like what, so what is that um, exact point at which after you have more money than X, your happiness no longer increases at the same speed? Because I think that's a really important um, thing to figure out where that is. Um, and also to think, is that something that only really the top 5% that owns 95% of the wealth in the world actually has the ability to surpass? Um, and, and then if that's the case, uh, w does that mean that um, these exercises that we're, we have here, like couch surfing um, or neighbor goods, are those really just sort of uh, palliatives that make us feel a little better, feel a little bit like we're participating in something that's a little bit less alienating than uh, the market that you know, determines the rest of our lives and, and the, the way we spend the rest of our time? Um, you know, I just uh, I just got back from Senegal and I was um, spending some time in cities and urban and, and rural areas there, and there, uh, there's a there's a practice in Senegal of um, you know if you don't have any money you just kind of go to one neighbor's house for lunch and then you go to the next day you go to a different neighbor's house for lunch and different neighbor's house and um, you know ev eventually you get fed and people feed each other and that that's like this gift economy and it's great except they don't have hospitals um, and doctors and literacy and you know sewage systems and roads and um, so like they've got but they've the got this not, right. but the two are not necessarily connected that because of that there is lack of hospitals right um, yeah yeah totally but i guess um the point i'm trying to make is that a, lo a lot of people like anthropologists traditionally have looked to the gift economy um at, or have looked to these uh primitive or um you know other communities as places where the gift economy still exists or used to exist and that's kind of a model for this new future um, and i hear that i hear that a lot i hear the sort of um rom romanticism or idealization of this past moment but i guess um what i'm what i'm wondering and i i have this conversation a lot with marina because uh, uh, we work together and we talk a lot, um, so I feel like I can just be really out there and challenging here. But um, you know, what what if what if all this stuff that's going on is really just a palliative? What if it's something to uh, make first world wealthy people just feel a little bit better? And um, you know, how do we actually? Uh, sorry, what's your name? Sorry, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. I'm going to get it wrong. B. Okay. Um, okay. So, how do we get to like, what B is talking about from what you're talking? About? I'll just second his question. <sighs> <laughs> okay. There were a lot of different, and I don't have answers. I mean, I'll be honest with you. We're all struggling through this. We're finding our way around. All I can, you know, one of the slides that I showed the people who were doing Science Hack Day, the woman who leads that. Her mission in life is to make these very expensive things disruptively accessible. So, you know, her dream, this is Ariel, is, you know, she's totally into this space elevator idea, which is kind of a crazy idea, but would take a lot of money. And 
her dream is to make it. And it's possible to make, I, I see constantly people doing things that previously only was expensive. You know, take clinical trials. I mean, that's the point of all this, is that it is making it radically accessible, I think, at new levels. So I do think there is a shift. Um, I also recognize, you know, we all live in legacy organizations. You know, legacy schools, legacy government, legacy companies, all of that, those systems are very difficult to change. Although, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, it, it's actually kind of interesting to see how easy it is for very strong, or whatever, things or institutions to fall and, and, and quickly. So it, it's kind of interesting to be looking at that. Um, I don't know what's enough. I do know that these kinds of income disparities, um, they create new kind of insecurity in all of us because once you have somebody at that extreme level, the average moves. So what used to be, you know, this is good enough or this, I'm satisfied with this, you kind of create these new expectation of what, and that to me is, very unbalancing. Um, I, I do believe, and this is my optimistic part, is that it's not just palliative. It's possible that some of it is, but I do think that it's fundamentally changing economics of the game. It's changing what it costs to get stuff and to create stuff and to make it affordable. So if you brought, I don't know who was talking about the car, the new car, I would love to bring together you with these hackers who are, whose mission in life is to make everything radically affordable and see what you can come up with together. And maybe it's possible to make it affordable. They've produced like PCR machines that cost on the market like $10,000, they can do it for $300. But are they getting distribution? I think. Now they're trying to get distribution, yeah. Because I think the thing that I'm thinking about and that I'm hearing um, and watching is I walk into West Elm and see my friend's art like commercialized and they probably get a nickel on the $20. And it's, there's like a pretty radical, I'm a Marshall McLuhan fan from day one. And as soon as the idea, the, the time lapse between the, the idea being put into the world versus it being uh, leveraged for commercial gain outside of the mm -hmm. first person thinker's benefit is sort of getting super short from what I can see. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with distribution, it has to do with, which is a very particular part of the, the, from the thinking to doing to saying to getting people to make the first one and to, to getting to making the 500th one or whatever, but it's getting the Tesla car out of that factory and like to really actually play. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very, to me, it's a very particular part of the problem or the, the problems that I feel like I am constantly thinking about and challenging. And I think I introduced myself as someone with a problem with authority and when I think about <laughs> what that problem is, it's about distribution or feeling like a, that it's controlled in a very strange way. And I don't know if that's an economics question or a share question or what, but it, um, if anybody has any thoughts. Um, hmm. I realize that I'm, uh, I ask the question of the wrong people and it's something that we always do, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm asking us what is enough. We're the wrong people to ask. The, <laughs> the, the top 5% are the people that we should be asking what, when is enough? How, how rich do you have to be? It's like, you know, the, um, the tax bracket for anybody making over a quarter of a million dollars is 35%, you know, and folks want to raise it to 38%. But if we do that, that's raising taxes and that's socialism. But then we talk to unions, you know, we tell the unions um, to give up their collective bargaining rights 
and that's doing your share, right? And so that's a, that's a thing that I think all these economic questions are almost always being asked of the underclass and not of the gazillionaires. It's like you have a gazillion dollars. <laughs> when is enough? So I apologize to everyone for asking you the question that I should have been asking the super rich motherfuckers. <laughs> I, I, do, I do have a what is enough that I'm sitting over here, sitting on over here. <laughs> and that is that when I'm um, falling into my, my color girl pity party over, um, can I hang on and still pay rent in the Bay Area and be a nonprofit profit arts administrator and a nonprofit musician? Um, how can I hold on? staying here. And so it gets back to the me, the me, the individual, individual, and pointing out there. Um, so um, I always bring it, I always boil it down to, I have an amazing privilege over many, many people on this cl planet that I'm gonna be grateful for at this moment to help open my mind up to thinking forward. And that is that I have indoor plumbing. I'll tell you, indoor plumbing is enough. <laughs> indoor plumbing changes how you live. Um, and so I find my gratefulness in, I have indoor plumbing. <laughs> and I will find enough food. Um, but how can I open my mind? So what I'm really hearing from you guys right now, and really grateful for in the reading materials and the videos that you sent out prior to this, is that um, we are in a day and age of a whole new level of accessibility of information. Um, and then we get to the education of how do you process it and what do you do? Well, I have just enough education to think about me and say, okay, well, I'm reading this. This is how I'm already sharing. This is, um, this is working for me. This is working for my bands. This is working for all the dis different artists that I'm working for and the creative class that I'm also working for and hoping and always striving to be a part of. So what's the next step? Um, do I take it you know, uh, past my neighborhood, the people I can walk to? Um, how do I take it to the next neighborhood? Um, and this is where the distribution of communication comes into play. So right now I'm feeling extremely grateful uh, that I have the capacity to hear what you're saying, that I'm still trying to grow to get what I'm not getting, um, and that you have a voice, and that we're right now in this energy space, in this beautiful space um, that the community built, to talk about this and to try to go beyond um, the me. I don't know how to do it yet. I know I do it in different ways a little bit, um, but if I, and I always, I keep thinking, oh, if I had more money, then I could get, uh, I could actually buy a house. There were with different, with more of the one bedroom so that we, I could have, we could have share this kitchen. Um, um, and, uh, you know, so I, don't, I keep thinking, oh, if I just had more money, like that's just the biggest currency. Um, and I have such, uh, so much currency and other different kinds of currencies, but not the money. And so I, uh, so I always hit that wall saying, oh my God, if I just had the currency that everybody's using, I could beef up this other currency. Um, and, and then I get all frustrated and I go, I have indoor plumbing. I have indoor plumbing. And then I try again. So I guess what I'm really saying is thank you. Um, and we have to keep sharing the information so we can figure out how to share beyond the people we know and go to the people whose names we don't know. And I'm committed to that. And so I'm just really grateful for the consciousness of the room of everyone trying to see what we can, where we can step to next. I just wanted to, I, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody to, to address that, that question of, of when is enough and reframe it, how much is enough. Like in this group, we're talking, a, we, have so in, in, we have so internalized a value system that we hate that we are willing to ask ourselves that question, how much is enough? I mean, running water coming out of my tap that I can drink because I've been to too many places where that's not true, right? So I don't mean to glamorize poverty or anything like that, believe me, and I have a very nice lifestyle. I, I, I will cop to that. But, but what I have that my much wealthier comrades in this country don't have is the thrill of being in a room with these kinds of people, having, the, having an art experience like... Like I work in a place where I can walk into a gallery almost any time I want to and engage art all the time. Like that is where I, I can trade that for anything. So, but we as a community are so angry about being at, on the bottom of the, that, the monetary scale that we often fail to see where we're at the top 
of the value scale. And what I hear you guys saying is, no, you, you, you're at the top, take the top, take it, assert, stop being the victim, start being the leader that you can be and assert those values because that's the other way which we are doomed. We are doomed, we're, we're just, as a planet, we're doomed. So we are the ones, I loved when you said, Neil, that you, what you <laughs> expect out of artists, what you want out of artists about being myth makers and shamans and telling that story and I'm, I'm seeing way too much art that's complaining about this part and not taking a, really an advancement forward for what we really, what we really, what you really represent, what we really are. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say um, the other part of B's kind of question, which is sort of about what you're talking about, is the education system and the way that this whole thing kind of goes down in the education system, whereby art becomes this form of entertainment. And I think that in order to do this, sort of make this kind of collaborative cultural change, one of the things that we can do is be sort of partially responsible for all of the other things we do besides making things or products or whatever, which is that we are sort of in the world in lots of different ways. I think all of us have to do sort of a few different things in order to put together a living. And in doing so, maybe somewhere along the line, art becomes this more social form. And I don't know how that can happen, but I think that the sort of way in which art is seen, particularly in this country, is that it's this sort of very distant thing for most people. And I think there's kind of a problem in that that we can do something about. That's all. Okay, we're at break time. Um, so let me explain what's gonna happen. We're gonna take a break. Please don't leave because there's more fun ahead. Um, and we're gonna sort of change all of this up so that we can uh, have a, a more, a more fruitful and more interesting and even more uh, in-depth conversation. So around the room there are five tables and at each table is a particular question and I'll read you the questions but they're posted on the flip chart so you can go uh, figure what they, out what they are. What would an economy look like if compassion and humanitarianism were guiding principles? How can non-money economies, barter, trade, exchange, gift, etc., transform overall economies? Based on what we've been witnessing in Wisconsin, what is your vision for potential new models for workers and labor in government? What motivates you to work or contribute your skills to the public good? How does money motivate you? And how can art be central to economies of the future? What would an art currency look like? So everybody pick a question that sounds interesting to you. And when we come back from the break, we'll gather around the tables. Um, I don't know if you know this, uh, many years ago I went to England and I visited the House of Commons and took the tour and when we went in the House of Commons they told us, which I had no idea, that there's not enough seats in the House of Commons for all the members. And that's a deliberate decision because they feel that by doing that it forces people to be really crowded together and the energy of the debate goes up. So there's not enough seats around the table for all the people that are here. <laughs> so that we're going to force you to, like, you can stand, you can sit on, you can hang out, whatever, around the table. So um, it's a deliberate decision in order to generate conversation. You'll have, like, 15 or 20 minutes to have that conversation at the table. The tables are covered in paper, so you can write, draw, paint, do whatever you want on the on the uh, um, the tablecloths, there's also post-its and stuff. So as, however you feel, and by you I mean everybody, audience, we're in, in, uh, welcoming you into this part as well. However you want to respond to that question. After 20 minutes, you can move to another question. You can stay there, um, it, whatever is interesting to you. But the idea is that we add, that the conversations are additive. So we'll do three rounds. At the end of the third round, um, we, it, there will be somebody at each table who will report back so, some sort of a digest of kind of what came out of the conversation. Obviously there are only three rounds and five questions, so you only get to participate in three out of the five questions, so, or fewer if that's uh, what you want to do, okay? So we have refreshments here. Um, we have to take about a 15 minute break and we'll be back about, uh, about three o'clock and uh, five till three and we'll do, uh, do this for the last hour. Thanks. <laughs>